think people will be familiar with the Westinghouse model 3A and 3, which was manufactured from about 1924 onwards for several years. There were apparently about 169,000 of these made, so they're not really a rare radio, but uh, they have some interesting features, and they certainly represent radio art at uh, the beginning of the second decade of the 1900s. I was given a Westinghouse radio at 3A, which was in reasonably bad condition, and uh, in fact the variometer inside was filled with a mouse nest, and the dead mouse was still in the cabinet. So it needs a lot of uh, cleaning and general repairs, especially to the wiring, and the uh, cabinet of course has to be restored. So what I'm going to do in this short video is show the essential steps in that restoration. You see the schematic for the Radiola 3A. It's quite simple, of course, but it has a couple of unique features uh, for the time. The first is that the variometer is all one large coil on about a two and a half inch diameter coil form with two rotating coils inside. This first one acts in opposition to the main antenna coil and thus varies its inductance so you can uh, select the station. You can also attach the antenna to one of these connections which provides different capacity or in one case a tap on the coil so that by a combination of antenna connection and this part of the variometer you get your selectivity. The second rotating coil of course is the regeneration control. And then on the output you've got push-pull tubes which is quite unique for the uh, vintage 1924 I think. It's intended for a loudspeaker, which a horn type loudspeaker which you put here and this is actually a tapped inductance, it's not a transformer. And uh, if you want the loudspeaker, you connect it here. If you want to use the earphones, you connect it here. And if you can save your batteries if you've got the earphones on by turning this rheostat down and uh, essentially turning these two output tubes off. This um, schematic, which is really for an RCA radio, a 3A, although it's identical to the Westinghouse, says it uses one UX199 and three UX120s, although in the earlier example I had, uh, which I showed in the title to this presentation, it uses WD11s. Uh, what I'll do for this set, which came with no tubes, is possibly make some reproductions using uh, field effect transistors in the tube base, since it's very unlikely I'll ever be able to get or afford the uh, tube complement that's actually required. Here I have the front panel and all of the components out of the radiola cabinet and um, I'll point out some of these things as I take them off. Here we have the um, tapped output inductor that I showed on the schematic. It um, is attached to this tube base and here you have a Bakelite panel with the um, connections for two tubes. This is supposed to be supported in a shock mount with rubber uh, bands here and over here, but of course uh, they have completely crumbled over the years, so that's going to have to be replaced. This is the driver transformer for the push-pull output tubes. It's a replacement. It should look like uh, this transformer here, but um, that's very difficult to get, so I'm going to restore the set using the replacement transformer. Here is the first interstage audio transformer. That's from the detector to the first audio. And here is that panel with the input condensers. It's quite interesting uh, because in 1924, here you have something almost like a modular assembly. If they had continued this, it uh, would have had something like a printed circuit a lot earlier. Here is the first interchange transformer again with these uh, two tube sockets. One has a uh, solidified rubber band still attached, so that's good because I'll be able to use that as an example 
uh, for replacing it. I actually have here a chunk of bicycle tube and I'm thinking that several layers of this might suffice if I don't find anything better to uh, replace these uh, shock mounts on the tubes. This is a particularly good example here, albeit it's completely solidified. So that's the uh, transformers. Here are two filament rheostats, one for the first two stages, second for the push pull output. Kind of interesting assemblies because they, uh, part of the rheostats are actually molded into the front panel. Anyway, that's easily a disassemblable. Here then is the variometer in which uh, the mouse had its nest. It's got uh, two rotating coils with two springs, as I noted on the schematic, and um, it's severely corroded in there. Can't really see it in this um, photograph, but uh, this is going to have to come completely apart and be restored itself. It's, it's quite a mess inside there because of uh, the uh, lack of hygiene of the mouse, I suppose. And here is a shielding panel that goes on below that variometer and provides some connectivity as well. And then I'm down to the panel itself. Um, there are two plug-in connectors here, one for the uh, loudspeaker, the other for earphones. And uh, there is the panel. I'll try to uh, get a close-up of this just to show what needs to be done to it. So here is a close-up of uh, the kind of cleanup that I'm going to have to do on this set. See, um, it seems to be just the uh, grease and dirt of the ages on it. So um, I'll probably take some very mild cleaners to that first of all, and then um, after that's done, if if need be, I'll uh, refill some of this. Uh, engraving down here you see and uh, and here it may not come off in the cleaning process hope not but uh, we will see how that works well here I'm going to start the uh, first wash I've got just uh, good old Mr. Clean here and we'll see how this uh, first layer of dirt comes off I think uh, we can assume Mr. Clean is safe for hard rubber, which is what I think this panel is. So a little scrub, and it doesn't seem that the that the um, white fill in the engraving is coming off. I'll have a quick look here and see if this is working. So obviously this is a bit uh, greasy, but the uh, major dirt is off. So now I'm going to use a uh, somewhat, what would I say, cleaner more like a solvent and get the grease off and then we'll see how it looks after that. Well, here's my panel uh, washed and dried on both sides. As you can see, it's actually looking quite good, but uh, I can see grease residue up uh, along here. So what I have is, uh, so-called Goo Gone, and it's um, advertised as a citrus oil-based cleaner. So I've tried that on a small um, portion of the panel, just to make sure that it's not going to dissolve anything. So um, I'll take a whirl at this part right here, and see how it gets rid of that <coughs> ancient grease. Dry it off. And uh, you can see it works quite well. And in fact, the, um, the, the white engraving fill has not been affected. So I might be lucky. Uh, I might uh, now try taking a, a toothbrush to some of that engraving after I've got the, the major grease off and uh, see if I can clean that up. Maybe it won't require any fill at all. Okay, I've got my handy toothbrush here. I'll put a little goo gone on it and uh, 
try it here on the Radiola 3A uh, logo. And so far the uh, fill paint seems to be holding up. <clears throat> so I'll dry that off and see how it looks. Comes out to actually looking quite good. I'll, I'll see if I can get this closer to the lens and uh, so you can see it there. It's looking quite clean. So I'm quite happy with that. I guess I'll proceed with uh, the other dials like this one here, battery setting, where you could hardly see the words before, in particular the word uh, off down here, <clears throat> but even this was dirty. Give it a good scrub with goo gone, dry it off, and again um, even that has uh, come up quite well as I guess you can see here. So that's quite successful. I'll carry on and uh, degrease the back as well. Here through the uh, wonders of time-lapse photography I've actually got the uh, panel completed and as you can see, although having a bit of trouble uh, giving you the right view here, this has turned out to be uh, a very nice clean panel and uh, good engraving too as I mentioned several times that's what I was worried about so now I've got the boring bit over with except for the uh, wooden cabinet but I'm going to leave that till the last so now I can start on the disassembly of those tube sockets I think and uh, determine how I'm going to put the rubber shock mountings in them Here's one of the uh, tube and transformer assemblies. As you can see, uh, in this case, it's, um, I believe this is the output choke that I showed in that schematic. And it's fastened to this frame with four screws and then the uh, tube sockets themselves uh, mount on those rubber shock mounts which are clamped between uh, these members and uh, this frame. So. I will take this uh, all apart and see then whether or not the, um, the metal that the frame is made out of is going to require maybe some kind of um, cleaning up, get rid of the corrosion. Anyway, it, it all has to come apart because um, of the fact that these rubber shock mounts are clamped between the various uh, parts of the metal assembly down below there. So without boring you further with the disassembly of this, I'll, I'll get it done and uh, then show what it looks like when I'm down to the bare bones, so to speak. I'll take off the transformer now and uh, just as a matter of interest, the uh, tube socket, uh, Bakelite panel I guess you'd call it, even though it's uh, on rubber shock mounts, it's actually retained in there by a couple of small brackets, um, so I couldn't get it out now without disassembling the frame anyway, so I'll proceed to do that. Well, I'm about ready to take this whole thing apart, so I might as well show that process. I've got most of the screws out, get the other one here, for any of you that uh, might actually get around to restoring one of these. There's one of the um, pieces of metal that retains the shock mount. So there you have one end panel, there's the tube socket, and of course there's the other end uh, bracket, and of course these things are retained still by little uh, ground leads coming from the tube socket, which of course is for the filament supply. So there is a tube socket and uh, two end brackets. I'll see if I can get a close-up of this. It's probably not very good lighting, but you can see two tubes up in uh, each end, like here, for example. There's a bit of the old rubber remaining, which circles around uh, the brackets there, similarly on the other end. So um, that's what I'm going to have to repair, <clears throat> and I'll probably start by seeing whether my handy bicycle tube is going to be thick enough um, maybe in two layers to uh, suffice uh, as that missing shock mount. 
Well, one thing I did forget to mention, of course, was uh, the condition of these brackets now that they're off. And you can see that, indeed, there's quite a bit of rust and corrosion here. And uh, not too bad on the other side, but still, if you look at it closely, it looks a bit ratty. So what I'm going to do here is uh, take my usual approach and put these into dilute uh, hydrochloric acid until I see uh, clean bare metal. And then there's a the question of uh, what to do to make sure that uh, it doesn't corrode again. And even though it's not uh, de rigueur, as they say, I think I'll probably spray them with clear lacquer except where electrical contact is needed. That uh, happens to be uh, these two brackets where um, there's actually a ground bracket from the, the tube socket and other places attached as well. And uh, that should keep it clean for a while, even though, as I say, that's uh, maybe not what the purist would do. Well, here I am out in my garage with my um, MG car in the background there. I've got my good uh, Canadian Tire hydrochloric acid here and uh, I'm going to now mix some of that up and put those the first set of that uh, metal brackets into it. Um, we'll use a whole lot of acid. It's about uh, 1 to 20 or something like that. Use one of these to stir it up a bit. And uh, over here I have baking soda in water, which I'll use to neutralize these after the acid has done, done its thing. So I'll throw these brackets in, and uh, that should take, I would say, about 15 to 20 minutes if I've got a sufficiently strong solution there. I'll pour a bit more in because I don't see a whole lot of bubbles coming off the metal. That's usually an indicator. So put some in there and uh, that should start it going and when you see little bubbles coming off the metal um, it's actually going to make um, ferric chloride I believe and it will eventually clean itself off might need a little bit of buffing with very fine emery paper but that's about it and then as I said uh, once they are clean I'll probably spray them with clear lacquer but just uh, scrape off the lacquer where I have to make a ground connection to those brackets later in the radio. There you see the metal bits uh, in the acid that's um, taking longer than I thought so there must be um, a slightly different coating on this metal than uh, what I've experienced before. So I'm going to have to leave this for probably uh, maybe up to an hour or so. I'm doing this in my garage because uh, obviously this is pretty corrosive and there is one heck of a smell comes off it as well. So it's not too good an idea to do it in the basement. So I'll leave this for a while and I'll come back to it and see how the acid has worked. Here are the uh, brackets taken out of the acid and neutralized in the baking soda and then with the loose uh, debris brushed off with a toothbrush. I haven't uh, applied emery cloth to these yet, but you can see they're fairly bright. So um, I'll probably give them a slight buffing, maybe with emery cloth or steel wool. And I'll then uh, take apart the other uh, tube assembly and uh, treat it likewise. And then I'll be ready for reassembling that part of the radio. Here you see the tube mount and transformer assembly that I didn't take apart so I can have it as an example. And this is the shock mounting for these two tubes. It's uh, a fairly thick rubber band clamped on either bracket and goes into a slot here on the tube socket and then up again. So I'm going to uh, make uh, that rubber band out of this handy uh, piece of bicycle tube that I found on one of my walks. I'll layer a few of those <clears throat> together and uh, then I'll be able to reassemble the tube uh, brackets and tube socket that I took out and that I had shown uh, 
in the cleaning solution a little while ago. I'm now ready to cut my uh, rubber mounting strips out of this uh, piece that I have glued together from four layers of the uh, bicycle tube and I had this um, solidified sample from um, the uh, original tube socket that I can use as a, a guide for the width. So I'll slice this one in two and that will provide the shock mountings I need uh, for the for one of the two tube so two sets of tube sockets. I should say that each um, tube mounting item or element like this uh, contains two tubes, so two of these shock mounts per uh, each of those. I'm just using a very sharp knife here and slice along the measurement line. Uh, I think that accuracy is not terribly important here, although um, it does have to fit in these uh, little I guess slots you would see here. It, it actually goes around the slots thusly and uh, I guess you can see that there and then they bend down like so and the whole thing fastens in here and the ends of the um, those rubber strips get clamped between this bracket and this uh, protrusion on this particular uh, mounting bracket as well so it'll get clamped in there and I'll do that for both ends and uh, then I'll have to repeat the whole process for this other one which uh, I still haven't disassembled you see the transformer still on it the tube element in there with the uh, rubber mounting bands completely solidified after uh, what is it 70 some years so I'll proceed now to uh, mount these in here and show uh, what that assembly looks like after it's been uh, completed. As you might expect, this is a bit of a fiddly operation. You can see I've got one of these uh, shock mounts mounted here. Um, the rubber is clamped on that end and that end and goes down through and up again around that uh, projection and through those two slots and of course I'm using this as an example so I uh, won't forget which way to reassemble it you take this the second end and these rubber mounting strips go like so and then I have to stretch them as I'm mounting them with these uh, brackets that uh, pretty well centers this uh, tube mounting uh, strip in the center between two, um, I guess you call them limit stops that are punched out of this uh, end rack and there's one limit and there's the other and there's two more underneath. So it's a bit fiddly but uh, if you can stretch these appropriately then uh, the thing is going to end up floating in the middle of this assembly just as it should when it was uh, new. I should also mention of course that I cleaned off the uh, many many years of garbage off the tube sockets as well. Here it is with the second uh, shock mounting place and I'm going to stretch these. I have these brackets here and here loosely attached but if I stretch the rubber now it's not going to retain in place. I'm going to tighten these up a little bit which I will do now and see if I can stretch that now with just a bit of tension in there. And there you see it. it's come up to about the same level as the other one perhaps a bit uh, off balance at the moment and then I'll tighten this bracket and then stretch uh, the rubber on this side and tighten it accordingly and I will look for the thing to be centered this way between these brackets as well as uh, floating between these stops because it's supposed, even with the weight of the tubes it's supposed to float uh, above the, the bottom stops that are underneath the sockets. So I'll make that adjustment and that should be that finished. 
that I then have to figure out where all of these were going. I did make some notes. So I'll maybe have to go back and sand off the lacquer in some of these places where these few connections were supposed to be uh, connected to ground. Before doing that, I thought it would be a good idea just to check the float of these tubes now that they're in the socket and their weight is added to the whole assembly. But you can see now it's working just as expected. Floating nicely there. There's about maybe an eighth of an inch of play. And so therefore with these WD-11s added, it's still working as it's supposed to. There are these end bits of the uh, rubber shock mounts here and here that I can now trim off now that I've stretched them adequately. And that looks uh, pretty good. So I'm uh, quite happy with the way that turned out. It's uh, going to be a good model for attacking the second uh, tube socket and transformer assembly. I'm going to leave behind that um, second tube socket assembly briefly while I tackle this double ferriometer. You can see there's one coil in this side and another rotating coil in this side. I've already, in order to remove this, taken out the shaft such as this from both sides. One coil is for uh, regeneration and the other is uh, station tuning. There was a mouse nest inside this of course so it's extremely corroded and there's a lot of mouse debris in there as well. These are held in by these uh, spring contacts, spiral springs here and up here, those have to be unsoldered and then there is a very corroded set screw down in here that's on the shaft for those uh, spiral connectors. So I guess an application of liquid wrench or WD-40 or something will hopefully allow me to get those apart and then it's mainly a matter of cleaning this up and checking for undue corrosion or any problem with the coils then I can hopefully get it back together correctly again and uh, go on to other things. So I'd like to get this fairly nasty job over with. I think I'll tackle that one now. The first thing is to unsolder these two spiral spring contacts. I think they're just soldered in between two leaves here. So I'll get them off and then I'll hopefully be able to re remove those set screws that are rather corroded in there. I have given this a shot of liquid wrench so I'll upend it and pry away on the set screw with my big pliers, these little ones now, and lo and behold, it's, in spite of the corrosion it is turning and it seems to be loose in there so see if I can get this out or not. It, it turns but there's still so much corrosion in there that it's making removal very difficult. I'll try the one on the other end. It's also highly highly corroded. It does sort of turn. One more turn on it without breaking anything hopefully. Try in that spring. You see it's, it's very difficult too so I'm going to have to use a little more force on that maybe another application of a liquid wrench. I finally did get these out through uh, the use of a fairly large pair of pliers. I've got the shafts out there quite corroded and there's the coil from one end. When you know it's uh, got a wire through there which will have to be removed and here's the coil from the other end. I'll just uh, maybe see if I can get a close-up of that just to show how badly corroded it is. So here's the coil. You see that uh, corrosion on the set screw there and uh, mouse debris and so forth inside the coil. 
The linings itself don't appear to be too bad though. I guess they escaped. And inside the unit itself, there's more debris that I'll have to get rid of. So there's a fair amount of cleanup to be done here. Well, I must say, when I look at these through a lens, it's almost discouraging because these uh, shaft clamps are riveted to this Bakelite uh, tube and therefore I can't use some of my normal techniques for taking corrosion off metal. It's um, pretty bad looking stuff. So the question is do I drill or grind those rivets out and um, that gives them me their freedom to do what I want with these pieces of metal. Or do I try to use uh, hammery cloth and that sort of thing while they're still in place. So I'm going to have to think about that a bit. This one's not so bad. I can uh, easily use a brush on that and maybe uh, isopropyl alcohol to clean it up. Might give another coat of uh, clear lacquer depending how bad it looks after I've cleaned it. Speaking of cleaning, I have these transformers here too, which have the cases fairly, look fairly ratty actually, bits of rust coming through and so forth, so I think I'll clean them up and repaint them with probably black trim clad, from, because from what I can see in some good spots, it used to be a black glossy paint. So I, I feel fairly uh, easy about doing that, shouldn't be too much of a lack of authenticity there. So anyway, I'll have to stop and think about this problem of uh, these two rotating coils and see how the heck I can clean them up without uh, damaging them. Well, what I decided is I'm going to use my Dremel tool with a uh, wire brush on it to get rid of the, the worst of the rust and other crud in there. And then um, good old Canadian Tire Rust Remover, which is in fact uh, phosphoric acid and uh, that should brighten them up as much as I can given there's a lot of pitting in there and then it will uh, stop any further rust because that's what the um, rust remover does in the end it puts a sort of a inert coating on the metal. The, the rusty screw, set screws that came out of that they may get my hydrochloric acid treatment since they're really bad and it's faster that way anyway there's a little close-up of the type of wire brush I'm using. It's about uh, maybe a little over an eighth of an inch, or maybe it's a quarter of an inch in diameter. And that's going around at uh, very high RPMs, of course. And that's the uh, phosphoric acid that I'm going to use that you get at Canadian Tire. So I'll get on my high-powered glasses here and have a go at one of these, see how they turn out. This one's pretty bad, but let's see what happens. I suppose ideally you should be wearing a, uh, a face mask with all the things you hear about hatter virus and dead mice and so forth, but well, I'm not doing it at the moment. Anyway, this is 50 year old stuff, so hopefully uh, the viruses are dead. Anyway, I'll uh, put a close up of that and you can see how it's brightened it up. So there you see one of the brackets uh, with the set screw hole that was previously just an absolute mess. So that's got most or all of the corrosion off. Some of that roughness of course is pits caused by the rusting. But I'm now going to put phosphoric acid on that and let it sit for 15 minutes or so and then I'll neutralize it maybe with baking soda. Then the whole thing I'm going to wash in that degreaser called gunk. Well, I now have the metal retaining brackets uh, treated with phosphoric acid and neutralized with the baking soda. 
and then uh, dried of course and I have also taken these two rotating coils and uh, degreased them as I said or at least cleaned them up using that gunk uh, solvent, fairly mild solvent and I did likewise with the major part of the variometer assembly and all of the mouse debris is out of that as well so I can now reassemble it I should say that somebody that was a little more astute than myself of course would have made a note of which phasing these coils had as they went into this larger uh, diameter coil but I didn't however uh, since I have this diagram of the radio uh, it's pretty well self-explanatory and in the event that I've maybe put things in the wrong way <clears throat> I can check that by um, using a signal generator and, and making sure that in the maximum coupling position it's uh, got the uh, widest frequency band I guess you would say and in this position it's got the minimum so I'll reassemble it carefully with reference to the diagram putting in these little spring contacts and ultimately mounting this to the uh, faceplate of the radio and uh, reinserting these um, shafts and their knobs these I have cleaned off using emery paper because ordinarily they would not fit in these uh, clamps but now they're okay so I'll now proceed to do that and that having been done really the next step is to reassemble the radio as a whole well, here I have the hard rubber top plate for the radio which I had cleaned up earlier and on top of that mount these two filament rheostats there and there then these two tube socket assemblies which I had repaired earlier there's a ground plate which fits down in here and on top of that goes the variometer and then two audio transformers here and here and there's a third one that fits over top of this um, rheostat and then of course there's this interesting terminal and condenser plate as well so what I'm going to do is start with the uh, rheostats and get them on and then I'll tackle this variometer which is a bit complicated because the bottom edge of the or bottom point of this rotating coil is retained by these shafts which go through from the front of the plate and then the coil has to be turned around a few times to wrap this uh, connecting wire around the shaft so you've got a freedom of movement of the shaft then after that these spiral spring connectors can be resoldered so I'll start with that and I guess in some respects I'm doing this backwards to my normal process because normally I would have refinished the cabinet first and got that out of the way because it's really the job I like the least. But anyway, I'm doing it backwards this time so I'll now start with the assembly and show it after I've got the variometer securely attached. As I was putting this thing back together I sort of wonder about the production processes back in those days um, when this thing was made like everything it depends very much on the sequence in which you put things together otherwise it's extremely fiddly to get these parts back in the way they're supposed to be for example well, here I have the two um, tuning and regeneration knobs attached but they have their position um, how would I put it, braked in a way by pressure washers underneath here way down in there and they're almost impossible to get together along with the um, the shaft bushing with the set screw there unless you put these in first before you ever have the variometer attached to the ground plate otherwise spend half a day trying to get the thing together properly Anyway, I've now got my rheostat on and the variometer with the knobs attached. I should have mentioned I had to clean them up too because they were filthy. So that appears to be working as it's supposed to. Got the two 
uh, spiral spring contacts connected as well. So at that point I can carry on with the assembly of the uh, tube socket units. Well here you see I've got uh, quite a lot of it assembled. The two rheostats on, the two tube top socket um, assemblies there and there, and of course the variometer and the knobs on the other side. There are a few cautionary notes which of course uh, you find out by doing things the wrong the first time. The first is that uh, all of these little brackets here are held on by short screws whereas the long screws are reserved for things that attach to the front panel here. And of course uh, I didn't bother to take note of that so after having got my tube socket assemblies nicely put together I had to extract these screws being very careful not to let the tension get away on the rubber bands that I had stretched take out the long ones, substitute the short ones so I had enough to put all these bits together uh, underneath these two filament rheostats there are also pressure washers, you have to get them on the right side, that's the front panel side and then of course when you put them on that's off in this position. So you have to align these appropriately here when you're putting them together. And it's just a question of probably when you take it apart make sure you're taking notes as to how to put it back together again so you don't have to do it twice. In any event it wasn't um, a terrible job and I've got to that point so far. I'll now put the transformers on and then I'm going to have to scrounge some new hookup wire, uh, cotton covered wire and some bus wire in order to get the thing all back together in its working state. So finally it's reassembled. As you can see here, everything back together. I even have the cable reattached. I had to cheat a bit. There was the usual problem in this uh, braided covering where mice or acid had eaten away at the cloth. It would have been possible I suppose to weave a new part in but that's really complicated so I put on heat shrink tubing. That's probably a bad thing but um, really I, in the time available didn't know what else to do. Some of the things, uh, this interstage transformer here is actually a replacement. Strangely enough, it was a replacement though when I got the radio. Uh, the mounting holes, however, did match these brackets down here, so that was no problem, and it was still good. Another thing I noticed is that uh, some of the dirt on the various parts of this radio can be taken off of the water. Some needs alcohol and uh, the very odd part needs something uh, a little stronger. There are certainly th types of dirt that alcohol won't touch and soap and water will and vice versa. Anyway, that's um, something you have to experiment with. I found that also putting this thing together, a lot of it had to be rewired before putting in these transformers, otherwise uh, you really can't get at the places where the connections are being made. Uh, on the binding post hardware over here, I actually used uh, phosphoric acid to dip to brighten them up and then a little bit of emery cloth. They were really quite um, dirty, I wouldn't say corroded so much. And uh, as usual when you tackle a job like this, there's always one screw missing at the end no matter how carefully you save them. But fortunately in your junk box you can usually find a replacement. So I have that done. The next thing is going to be tackling the cabinet. It's um, in somewhat rough shape. You can see it's, um, it's kind of a stain and there's a very dull looking nameplate right there. The odd scratch here, deep scratch in the wood bits uh, out of the wood there. Extremely filthy inside. I'm going to have to wash this out with probably uh, soap and water and Javex to get the mouse dirt and smell out of there. It's really quite filthy. You can't really see it very well on that uh, 
in this video perhaps. Underneath, uh, not too bad. Still has the little bumpers on the bottom and so forth. So I'm going to probably clean this up with uh, a fairly active solvent, maybe even lacquer thinner to begin with, see if it uh, takes off the worst of the dirt and maybe take the, the stain down to the wood so I don't have to use a more harsh uh, paint stripper. So that's what I'm going to do next, take all this hardware off of course, and that doesn't appear to be a job that's going to take a great deal of time, unlike where you've got thick layers of old paint and lacquer to remove. Well, one of the advantages you get when taking off a little nameplate, such as this old one here, is that underneath it shows what the original finish was like. And in fact, I can see from this that there was a stain and a very light coating of what appears to be nitrocellulose lacquer. So that gives me a good idea of what to do with this cabinet now uh, once I get around to uh, removing the old, um, I guess, lacquer and uh, stain. This is the uh, Canadian Tire Lacquer Thinner I'm going to use as a first try at cleaning up this cabinet. I'm doing this out in my garage because of the problem of the fumes. So here I have my cloth moistened in that lacquer thinner and just keep rubbing a bit and I see that by the look of it the old grease and crud is coming off quite nicely and the more I rub in fact it's coming down to what might be an acceptable finish for an old uh, or a radio that this is uh, old but I'll keep going and see what the results like it's, it's coming up very nicely actually quite clean so I could, I'll have to decide eventually am I going to just wax this or am I going to take down the roughness a bit with a bit of very fine sandpaper and then use nitrocellulose lacquer or if I do sand it at all is that going to require me to use more stain. What I can do of course, although the wood is not quite the same, I can try it on the bottom here and certainly I can judge by this sort of a clean bit that was underneath the old metal label and when I look at this end and what's under the metal label, they actually look very similar. So I may not have as much of a refinishing job here as I originally thought. Here you can see in close up what this looks like now on that end that I cleaned with the lacquer thinner. Compare it to that, that's the original, but here of course is the bit that was underneath the label which represents the original finish. So as you can see that's very close and I'll now sit back for a little while, well maybe I have a beer and decide which way I go. Well I'll clean the rest of the cabinet of course, but after that there's this decision about the ultimate uh, refinishing. Well, I'm not a great fan of plastic wood, but in this case I didn't seem to have much uh, choice. There was this rather large scratch here, which was quite deep, and also this part of the uh, cabinet was broken, and I didn't see how I could fit wood into something like that. I'll show so of course once I was washing this down with alcohol I found that the, the original finish on this was shellac. Uh, you can tell by how sticky it becomes once you've got alcohol on it. And though I'm not a great fan of plastic wood as I said, I did fill these uh, scratches and then sanded them down. And I'm now putting a little bit of um, this so-called wood awake touch up pen on the plastic wood which will bring it up or down, whichever way, to the or roughly the original color of this stained finish. And then even though I'm going to stain it again, at least I'm working with plastic wood that has come up to roughly the same color. I suppose, well actually what would happen is if you stain that without using the pan, you'd have a heck of a time uh, getting an even uh, coloration to the wood. So I will 
sand this now and then um, I will use some water-based stain, get it good and dry, shellac it, and then I will probably use a thin coating of wax because as you know, uh, shellac is not uh, very good in uh, wet conditions just in case the finish should ever get wet for whatever reason and that will protect it and uh, bring up a little more of a shine as well. Well here I have my Lee Valley dark brown mahogany stain water based and I'm going to put a thin coating of that all over the front of the cabinet here and I'll, I will not let it sit too long because right at this moment I'm not sure how it's going to react in fact I'm going to test it on this end first and rub it off quickly and it appears to be quite a good match at this point. There's a, there's a slightly lighter part here near where I had to use that plastic wood, although I had to use the stain pen on top of that, as you may remember. And a light spot over here where I had to uh, replace that chip in the cabinet. So I'll give it another coat. It seems safe enough. And I'll let this one sit a little longer. It does seem to be a pretty good match. Now I could have, of course, sanded this all down to the original stain or even further and then brought it back up with more stain all over and shellac as well. But I thought maybe that's not terribly authentic. The rest of the cabinet is not bad and if I can get a good match on the front here with the ends and the back, of course, uh, to, seems to me that's perhaps a better approach. So I'll wipe this off and I can see already that it looks pretty good although of course stain looks different when it's wet than when it's dry. So I'm going to let this dry for a good long time. Make sure there's no water there otherwise it would react rather really badly with shellac. And I'll probably shellac the whole thing go over it with a very fine steel wool, use a tack cloth, and decide then whether it needs another coat of shellac or perhaps well, I'll just wax it and that will bring it back to very close to original condition. While I'm waiting for the cabinet to dry, I'm going to try to bring up the, um, the printing on this brass label that was on the front of the cabinet. Now this is um, not actually embossed by punching through the back as some are, but it has been etched so that all of the letters you see on the front are actually in relief from this thin brass plate. And what I have here is a polished marble tile on which I have taped some 600 grit emery cloth. The idea being this is perfectly flat and I can polish this by rubbing it on the emery cloth without actually taking off the paint which is slightly below the level of the lettering on this uh, label. So now I will put some light pressure on it and polish away, grind it down. It's slightly bowed this way, but still, when you put your fingers on with some pressure, it levels it out. And this is actually coming up quite nicely. It's, uh, maybe you can see it there, it's slightly corroded still in the middle, so I'll put a little more pressure on there and find some new surface of the emery cloth. Don't want to do it too much, or I can probably take the lettering right down to the paint. It's not bad at all at the moment. I would probably spray paint this with some clear lacquer after I've got the polishing done here. At this point I think I'll stop and just show how this has come up. You should be able to see that there in the light. You can see that it's polished quite nicely and hasn't taken the, the paint off the back here, or at least uh, below the letters. There's a bit of uh, corrosion still here I'd like to get off before I 
do my spray painting with clear lacquer so I'll give it another try and once I've got it where I like it I'll spray it and that should solidify that for a while. Well my cabinet dried all right I put one coat of shellac on it let that dry and rubbed it down with steel wool and it looks like I won't need another coat that might make it a bit too glossy so what I'm going to do now is wax it and you can see here what I'm using is this Goddard's cabinet makers wax I'll just pick a little up on my cloth here and go over the wood I think a uh, thin coat is what's generally needed for this stuff you don't want so much that it builds up and collects dirt and so forth I'll just let that dry briefly and then just as with any piece of furniture, give it a polish, Work briskly with a quite a nice soft lint free cloth, didn't get it down here, and you can see how that comes up, it's really not quite as shiny as maybe it appears in the video, and the wood in behind has a, a rough finish as it was originally anyway, so that's coming up quite good, I will now uh, finish the rest of it and put my label on it and then reinstall the radio. Here's the finished product with four WD-11s installed. I think the whole restoration took me about 40 hours or thereabouts over a period of maybe four months on and off. And so that's the Radiola 3A regenerative receiver and balanced amplifier restoration video for you.